Bueno, gracias a todos por la atención. En principio, ok, but I, I flip to English. I have been asked to say something about effective field theory. Of course, effective field theory is a very broad subject, so I don't know which of you probably are interested in a particular topic. An effective field theory is basically everything. So what I am going to try is just to give a flavor. That means I will not really enter in many technicalities. I will try, maybe if we look to the outline, I will start just by very general concepts of effective field theory, which have a very broad validity in many parts of physics. Then I will try to explain a little bit, only a little bit of effective field theory in QCD, what is called chiral perturbation theory. And then I will try to enter in what is the fashionable subject nowadays, that is electroweak effective theory. Of course, I don't think I could go very far. I put a, a fourth topic, which for me is the most interesting thing, but I doubt we will have time to enter there that is trying to make a matching between the effective theory and whatever fundamental theory lies below. Okay? But there the technicality goes up, so probably I will just say a few things and if somebody is interested on that, we can talk afterwards. Okay, let me start by, by the concept. What is an effective field theory? Effective field theory is just what you have been doing all your life but put in a, an appropriate formalist. What I mean by that? Uh, you know that uh, chemistry is electrodynamics. Okay? All the molecular binding comes from electromagnetic interactions. That means that biology is electrodynamics. Everything around us is made out of electrical forces, but nobody is so crazy to use quantum electrodynamics to do biology. Not even to do chemistry. Or not even to do atomic physics. When you do atomic physics, you don't use quantum electrodynamics. You use a non-relativistic version with a Coulomb potential. And you solve, uh, at most, the uh, Schrodinger equation to have some quantum mechanical description. And that's very, very far away from quantum electrodynamics. So what are you doing? you are doing an effective framework that contains the basics of quantum electrodynamics, but it has adapted the, the technicalities, uh, has adapted the technology to the system you are describing. If you try to describe, for, ins for instance, an organic uh, molecule with quantum electrodynamics, you are going to fail. It's too complicated. So, you need to reduce the the, all the complication of quantum electrodynamics to something simple. A Coulomb potential, maybe some uh, uh, hydrogen binding, some Van der Waals force, whatever. So you need to adapt your fundamental physics to the system you want really to describe. When you do that, usually you do models. And the problem with models is models are very useful to learn something. You learn the physics how it works, but at some point you want to test a fundamental theory. So what you want to do is an effective field theory, which means use all the power of quantum field theory adapted to your problem, but making sure that you are going to make a rigorous description that allows you to really test your fundamental theory, if you know it. Okay? So you don't want to make a model. To do that properly, you need to follow a series of rules, and for that you need really to understand from the quantum field theory point of view what you are doing. So I will start going to s through simple examples. They are very, very simple, so you immediately recognize things that you already know, but uh, I hope that you could get a different view of the things that uh, you have already been working on. So let's start with something very simple. Imagine that you are doing optics at very low energy. So you have uh, two photon beams, some lasers. The energy of your beams or your photons is very low. Low means that 
it's very low compared with the mass of the electron. So you are not able to produce electrons. So in your low energy world, you only have photons. So you want to write an effective Lagrangian which only contains photons, and you know the symmetries. So you know that the uh, uh, electromagnetic interactions have some gauge invariants, they are Lorentz invariants, they are invariant under parity, they are invariant under charge conjugation. Uh, maybe you know that the electron exists, or maybe you don't know that the electron exists. So the electron mass is your high energy scale, the new physics scale, whatever you don't see because you are not able to produce. Okay? So you are going to make an expansion in powers of energy over the high mass scale, over the electron mass. And your theory will be good, provided your energy is low enough. That means your energy is much, much lower than the electron mass. Now you build the most general Lagrangian with the ingredients you have. Gage invariants tell you that you can only use F mu nu. Lorentz invariants tells you that you need to close all the indexes. Parity and charge conjugation tells you that you can only use an even number of field electromagnetic strength tensors. So your Lagrangian can only have the form I have written there. You start with the normal F B nu F B nu term. The normalization of this term is fixed. It's the canonical normalization that you use to describe the photon field. Okay. And now you add more and more and more powers of F and you have a general Lagrangian which has an infinite number of terms. Okay. But as you go up putting more powers of F, you are increasing the dimension of the Lagrangian. So remember F mu nu has dimension 2. So F squared has already the dimensions of your Lagrangian. That's why this coupling here is just a constant. But now in the moment you put uh, the square, this is dimension 8, you need 4 powers, some mass scale to the 4th power to compensate the dimensions and get the right Lagrangian. So what do you put there? Your new physics scale, whatever it is. Of course, in this case, you know, it's the electron mass. Time some coupling that you don't know, but which does not have any dimension. Now you put, here is the same, this is a different structure that you can build. So with dimension 8, you have two different structures with couplings A and B. Now you can put 6 powers of F. This will be suppressed by 8 powers of the electron mass. So you are making this expansion. Your energy is low. So physics will be dominated by the lowest terms in this dimensional expansion. So you expect that your experiment will be dominated by A and B. And for the moment, you forget higher order corrections. So that means that at low energies, all the physics of this system is reduced to two couplings that you don't know. So you need to do two measurements to fix your Lagrangian. Okay? And there is no more because the symmetries don't allow you to write anything more. Of course, if you know quantum electrodynamics, you know how to compute A and B. Because you just go to your fundamental theory, your fundamental theory contains the electron, you compute the box diagrams, and then you know that there are one, two, three, four couplings, which means that A and B are proportional to L alpha square. You are going to get this electron mass to the fourth power from the calculation of the box diagram. But the calculation is only useful to get the numerical factor in front. The rest you know before computing anything. Okay. But even if you didn't know that quantum electrodynamics exist, you can fit data, get A and B. Of course, you will be fitting A divided by some mass scale to the fourth power that you don't know, and you will be guessing what is the mass scale that is hidden behind the photon interactions. Even if you know quantum electrodynamics, writing this Lagrangian is useful because it allows you to understand things without doing any calculation. 
Because, for instance, if you ask the question, what is the value of the cross-section? How the cross-section depends on, on energy, on frequency. That's very simple. You don't need to compute. Because the quantum amplitude is proportional to 1 divided by 4 powers of the mass scale. Quantum amplitude square will contain 8 powers of this mass scale. And a cross-section has dimensions of energy to the minus 2. That means that the cross-section grows as 6 powers of energy. So you don't need any calculation to learn that, but knowing that is very important, because imagine that you are in a, some optics lab and you want to do an experiment and trying to see if, uh, how behaves the photon-photon scattering cross-section. This formula already tells you that you should not uh, look for lasers with low frequencies. You should be looking the highest possible frequency you can get in your lab, otherwise you will not see anything, because this grows as a very high power of frequency. Okay, so, uh, this is already telling you that dimensions are very important in building a Lagrangian. So, let's me, let me put a different example. So let's ask a trivial question, why the sky is blue? Okay. It looks a funny question, but you can Google the question. So if you ask Google, Google will provide you the right answer. In fact, it will provide you 20 different sites where you can find the right answer. The right answer is Rayleigh scattering, and it's a very complicated answer. In fact, if you go to the library, you look for an optics book which answers this question is a very tricky question. Why? Because it, think about the problem. The blue, the sky is blue because there is light around, okay, and we see the blue light. But why the blue one and not the red one? Okay. So what are you seeing there? You see the scattering of photons, so light, with the atmosphere. The atmosphere means atoms. So you are looking to the uh, cross-section, which is photon-atom going to photon-atom. But atoms are neutral. Therefore, this scattering takes place through higher-order multiples of the atom electric field. Okay. So you really need to enter into a precise description of uh, how the atom looks like whether it is a dipole, or it is a quadrupole, or whatever. So you need to compute. But then, in addition, what you need to do to, to answer the question is to compute this cross-section and find out what is the dependence of the cross-section with the wavelength of the light, or with the frequency. Okay? And this is a problem which is solved in many books. It depends on many tricky issues of the calculation, so to get the precise answer is really difficult. But we are not asking the question on why is dark blue or light blue or what one day is more blue than some other day. We, are, we just want to know why it is blue and not red. <coughs> and this you should be able to figure out without any calculation. So let me, let me try. To get the right answer is very simple. So you need to think about the scattering. It's a scattering of photons with neutral atoms. Your photons have very low energies. What means low energies? Your energy is very, very small compared with the difference in levels of the atomic levels. So you cannot excite electrons in the atom. Okay. This is alpha square times electron mass. But it's much smaller than the inverse of the atom size, the Bohr radius. And of course, it's much, much smaller than the atom mass itself. So it's a very, very low energy scattering. Your atom is neutral. And you have gauge invariance. That means that it can only interact with photons through f mu nu terms. There are no covariant derivatives because the atom is neutral. It does not have an electric charge. Moreover, we can use a non-relativistic description. I could do the argument equally well with a relativistic description, but then I will need to introduce a little bit more of notation. So let's do it non-relativistically. That means that instead of m mu nu, 
I will be using E and B. Okay, but it's the same. So which kind of Lagrangian do you need? So it's an incoming photon, an incoming atom, and now it's an elastic scattering. So I need two fermion fields to describe the incoming atom and the outcoming atom. And I need two photon fields, either E square or B square, because in addition, my Lagrangian should be invariant under rotations and things like that. So this is the only lowest order Lagrangian I can write. I have put two arbitrary cu couplings, C1 and C2, and now I count dimensions. E square is F mu nu, F mu nu, basically. So this has already dimension 4, the dimensions that a Lagrangian should have, while the product of the two fermionic fields has dimension 3. I need to cancel these three dimensions. I need to divide by three powers of energy or multiply by three powers of length. Okay. So what I use here, it is not really important. I have used something in the middle, so I have used the atom size. <coughs> okay. If I make a good guess, this coupling should be order 1. If I don't make a good guess, so they will be 0.1 or they will be 10. Okay. But the important thing is that because the Lagrangian has the dimensions it has, it has dimension 7, I need three powers of some length, of three inverse powers of some energy, in the cup. Now you compute the scattering matrix. So the scattering matrix will contain A0 to the cube. Here, each electric field contains one derivative, so there are two derivatives. It will be proportional to two powers of energy. Each derivative brings one moment. Your cross-section is m squared, so in, instead of a0 to the cube, it will have a0 to the sixth power. And now you count powers of energy. This is 1 over energy to the sixth power. The cross-section should be 1 over energy squared. I need 4 powers of energy to get the right dimensions. So the cross-section increases as 4 powers of energy. Is clear the argument? And you don't need to compute anything to know the answer. So if you do the calculation, you will be computing the coefficient in front. But the result should, should have this dependence with the energy. Of course, energy means frequency. Now you know why the sky is blue. Because the scattering, the cross-section, is much higher for higher frequencies. And of course, blue is the extreme that you can see with the eyes. Yes? Uh, okay, now we enter into the details. Okay, which I don't want to enter. And why one day is more blue than some other day, it depends on many other things. Okay, but it's not red. Is that clear for everybody? Okay, so I hope I have convinced you that counting dimensions, it's called dimensional analysis, is extremely important. And there are many things that you compute in quantum field theory that you spend one week, two weeks doing complicated calculations and you should have guessed the result from the very beginning just doing a naive dimensional counting. In fact, it's very useful that you always do that because in this way you spot your mistakes. There is always some mistake. And it's easier if, if you analyze it carefully. Okay, so what you should remember. We are using natural units. The action does not have dimensions, so a Lagrangian should have dimension fourth, because there are four powers of length here. This one over energy to the fourth. They should be compensated by the dimension fourth of the Lagrangian. The Klein-Gordon Lagrangian has this form. You see an m square here or a derivative square here. So each Klein-Gordon field has <coughs> one dimension of energy. And that's the same for a vector field or for an axial field. In the direct Lagrangian, there is only one power of m. There is only one derivative, which means that two fermion fields give a dimension 3. A fermion field is dimension 3 over 2. 
And then a cross section is 1 over energy square because it's dimensions of surface. A decay width is dimensions of energy. And with that, you can make the counting for any kind of observable that you want to compute. Any question up to here? Okay, let's, let's see how important dimensions are. So let's analyze the, the most simple quantum field theory one could imagine. It's a Klein-Gordon field, which is real, and I put a cubic interaction. Okay. Well, cubic interaction, each Klein-Gordon field has dimension 1. That means dimension 3, the Lagrangian should have dimension 4. The coupling is not just a coupling. The coupling has dimensions of energy. And this is very important because now imagine that you compute a cross-section. So the elastic cross-section of two scalar particles in this theory. You don't need to do the calculation to see how the cross-section behaves. Why? Because one and two, there are two couplings. The amplitude is proportional to lambda square the cross-section is proportional to lambda to the fourth. Lambda to the fourth has dimensions of energy to the fourth. So you need six powers of energy in the denominator to compensate dimensions and get the right dimensions of a cross-section. So I am neglecting the mass of the object, so I am at very high energies. So this tells me that the cross-section goes down at high energy a six powers of energy, which means goes to zero very, very, very fast. So this Lagrangian is going to give irrelevant physics very soon. Because the cross-section will be so tiny that you do, will not detect anything. Okay? The Lagrangian will only be relevant in some given energy range, which will be low energy. Okay? Because then the suppression converts into an enhancement. If I try to go to zero energy, imagine that I put the mass equal to zero. Too, okay? And I try to go to zero energy, now I see that at very low energy, it grows as one over energy to the sixth power. And it becomes extremely relevant. But this is a classical result. Let's analyze the quantum corrections. Quantum corrections appear if I now interchange another scalar propagator. So I have two powers of lambda mu. So quantum corrections will have will be order lambda square. But lambda square has dimensions of energy square, so quantum corrections <coughs> will be lambda square divided by S. Which means that at high energy, the quantum corrections are totally negligible. They go to zero very fast. Now let's change the quantum. Yes? There won't be terms proportional to one over to other non star variables? Ah, yes, sure, sure, sure. But I am just, uh, I am S, T, and U, I am just putting the energy square. Yes, but the, when S is big, the T can be still small. No? No. Uh, it, it will always, T will be proportional to S times some factor could be 1 plus minus cosinus of theta, and then depending on the angle, you could have a, a, an, an infrared enhancement. That's true. But don't, don't bother about these details. Okay. Okay? okay? So you are not going to change dimensions by changing channel. Yes, that's true. That's true. Sure. Okay? More questions? So let's make a very slight change of theory. Instead of taking 5 to the cube, I take 5 to the 4. So naively, one could imagine that it's basically the same thing. But no, the physics is totally different. It's totally different because if I put 5 to the 4th, the coupling does not have dimensions. Okay? In addition, I can compute this process at three level with only one coupling, but this is not important. Let's put a quantum correction with a loop and get a lambda square factor. Okay? The, the argument is not going to change. What is the important in the argument? Here, m is proportional to lambda. Sigma is proportional to lambda square. 
lambda squared does not have dimensions, so the cross section will behave as 1 over s. It's a normal cross section. A cross section that uh, will give interesting physics in a very broad range of energies. Now you compute quantum corrections. So imagine you put another vertex, you make a loop. Okay? Quantum corrections will have an additional power of lambda, but lambda does not have any dimension, so they are not suppressed by any additional power of 1 over s. So quantum corrections have the usual suppression factor of loops, but nothing more. Quantum corrections are normal. So the two theories behave completely different. And the only reason why they behave different is just dimensions. Is that clear? So let's go to something that everybody knows, the Fermi theory. So you take mu and decay, you know the standard model, so you know that uh, you exchange a W, that the fundamental interaction is a W interacting with the charge current. But the mu has a very low mass. The W mass is very, very heavy compared to the mu mass. So this propagator is rings to a point. Because you can neglect Q square compared to the W mass square. So what you actually measure is the effect of a four fermion interaction with a local coupling, which is the Fermi coupling constant. And of course, you know that the Fermi coupling constant is g squared divided by a times the w mass squared because you know this graph. So you have g times g. This 2 square root of 2 squared is d8, and the propagator is the mw squared. But people were studying mu and decay when the standard model didn't exist. We didn't know anything about the w. The only thing that we knew is that uh, you see a muon decaying into a three-body final state. Therefore, the local interaction contains four fermion fields. Four fermion fields means dimension six. And therefore, this coupling has dimensions of one over energy square. So it contains some fundamental scale that you don't know, or you didn't know, and what you were doing is you measure the muon lifetime and you learn what this scale is. It was in this way that we learn about the W. Of course, you don't measure the W mass. You measure the W mass divided by whatever coupling appears in this W exchange interactions. Okay? So we knew that the W exists and we knew that the W mass was more or less around 100 GeV okay? for many, many years before discovering the W thanks to an effective uh, interaction. Okay, but even nowadays that you know that it is the W and you know to compute things with the standard model, to compute mu and decay, you don't need to compute with the standard model. You use the Fermi interaction. And you can learn many things without even doing the calculation. Because the decay amplitude of mu and decay will be proportional to the Fermi coupling. The decay width will be proportional to the Fermi coupling square. This has dimensions of 1 over energy to the fourth power. In order to get a decay width, you need some mass scale to the fifth power to recover the right dimensions. Now you are discussing muon decay, neutrinos are massless, the electron is 200 times lighter than the muon, so you can neglect the electron mass. The only physical scale you have in the problem is the mu mass. So the cross-section goes as mu mass to the fifth power. And this is a very strong dependence. If you know something more, you can put phase space. It's a three-body phase space. So you put it, and you get that up to a factor of two. This is the right answer if you do the calculation. But if you just look to the PDG and copy the three-body phase <coughs> space, you will get the right number up to a factor of two. So you only need to compute if you want the factor of two. Of course, if you do the calculation, you compute the phase space, and you compute all the dependence with the electron mass. Okay, but this is peanuts. Because all this function is 0.996. Okay, so let's forget about it. So what is important is that dimensions give you the dependence 
with the muon mass. Now you say, okay, what is the difference between tau decay and muon decay? It's the same graph, the same interactions. The only difference is that in tau decay, this will be the tau mass. In muon decay, it will be the muon mass. So the relation between the decay widths of tau and muon to electron is the fifth power of the ratio between the tau and the muon mass. Okay. It's a huge number. Okay, the tau is 1.77 GeV. The muon is 0.1 GeV. This to the fifth power there are many orders of magnitude. So this is what explains the lifetime difference between the muon and the tau. Okay. You can be more precise because you can do the comparison, for instance, looking to branching ratios. So you just you are computing decay width, so you divide by the total decay width, that's the lifetime. So is this ratio. So you predict 17.79 percent. Experimentally, 17.83 plus minus 0 0.04 is perfect. And you didn't make a single calculation. It's just dimensions. What else you can learn? Now you ask, what is the cross-section of the scattering of a neutrino with an electron to produce a muon and a neutrino? Well, it's the same argument. Grows as GF square. So, 1 over energy to the fourth power. Cross-section should have dimension minus 2, so it should grow as energy <coughs> square. Okay, so, without doing the calculation, you know that this effective Lagrangian, the Fermi Lagrangian, gives cross-sections which are crazy. They are crazy because they grow with energy, at high energy. Okay. So, is this the wrong answer? No. I mean, this is the right answer at very low energies, where you can forget about the W. So, this is an effective theory, which is only valid for energies which are very, very small compared with the W. If you go to energies higher than the W, then the effective theory is no longer valid. And that's why you get something crazy. It's crazy because you violate unitarity. You violate probability. At some point, the probability that something happens is much larger than one. It cannot be correct. Okay. So, this tells you the limitations of an effective theory. An effective theory is only valid in a given energy domain, domain. But if you analyze the predictions of the theory, the predictions themselves will be telling you when the effective theory is no longer valid. Because you will see that at some point you get crazy answers, they don't satisfy unitarity, so you are at the limit of your effective uh, field theory validity. This is very re relevant nowadays when people are applying effective operators at LHC, okay? and from time to time you see crazy papers uh, claiming, uh, look at very high energies because there is a large effect that grows, we should see that experimentally, and is, you are just at the limit of the validity of your operators. One should be careful. Okay, I think I have put enough number of, of examples, so let's introduce uh, uh, some notation or some language. So in effective field theory, one talks about relevant, irrelevant, and marginal operators. Okay, what's that? So an effective field theory is a general Lagrangian, which depends on some fields that you know, the low energy fields. And the Lagrangian contains an infinite number of terms, or a bunch of terms, which are just operators built with your low energy degrees of freedom, times couplings. Okay. These operators have dimensions, but the Lagrangian has dimension 4. So, you are going to order your operators from lower dimension to higher dimensions, because you are making an expansion in powers of energy over some scale, some new physics scale that you don't know. So, the dimensionality of your couplings depends on the dimensionality of the operators. If the operator has dimension d, your coupling should have dimension 4 minus d. So it should be some dimensionless coupling divided by some scale 
to the power d minus 4. Hmm? If you go to higher dimensions, you will have higher suppression. So you will always start with the lowest possible dimensional operators that you could build. Now, you analyze the behavior at low energies, where you want to apply your effective field theory. We are going to call relevant to any operator which have dimension is more than 4. And there are not many. In fact, I have only been able to write 4. I am putting some scalar field. It could be a vector field also. It will be the same. Or some fermionic field. So the identity does not have dimensions. This has dimension d square. This is cubic. This is cubic. Okay. But this one and this one are just mass terms. So really the only interaction I am putting here is the 5 to the cube interaction that we have seen before. Why these operators are relevant? Because d is smaller than 4. So instead of being suppressed by the new physics scale, they are enhanced by the new physics scale. Remember when we have analyzed the cross-section in 5 to the cube 30, the cross-section was going as 1 over energy to the 6th power. So at very low energies, this is extremely important. Of course, at high energies, it will become negligible, but we are at low energy. It's a low energy theory. So that's why the, this is called a relevant operator. So on whatever you have an operator which is relevant, put all your attention in this operator because it's going to dominate the physics. We are going to call irrelevant operators to those which have dimension bigger than 4. And here I can write many of them. Okay, Since I can go to any arbitrary dimension, I can write an infinite number of operators. But you can see already this one is the one which appears in the Fermi theory. Okay? So these operators are suppressed by lambda to d minus 4. So that means when, when, whenever you compute an observable with these operators, you are going to get a suppression factor that is energy divided by lambda, whatever lambda is, to d minus 4. So they are suppressed. That's why they are called irrelevant. Because uh, if you are at low energies, these operators are tiny. In fact, why weak interactions are called weak? Because we discover weak interactions at low energies. And at low energies, weak interactions are given by the Fermi Lagrangian, which is an irrelevant operator. They are suppressed by 1 over mw squared, so they are tiny. Okay? They are irrelevant. This does not mean that they are not important. They are important enough that we have discovered the W. But you need to discover the W looking to tiny effects, okay? because there is a suppression. We will call marginal to any operator which has dimension 4. Okay? And I have listed this type of operators. And here you can see that we call marginal to what you have been calling up to now renormalizable. Okay? Your renormalizable Lagrangians are Lagrangians with where all the operators have dimension 4. So they are not relevant, not irrelevant. They are just in the middle. Okay? Uh, all the all quantum field theory books emphasize a lot the concept of renormalizability. So there are good Lagrangians, the renormalizable ones. There are bad Lagrangians, the non-renormalizable ones. Forget about that. Okay? The important thing is not renormalizability. We will be renormalizing all types of operators. Okay, and you can renormalize an operator of dimension 24 without any problem. Okay? The crucial thing is not renormalizability, it's dimension. What is important is that an operator which is marginal has dimension 4, has a coupling, which is a true dimensionless coupling. Since the coupling does not have dimensions, it's going to generate cross-sections with the normal behavior, which are valid in a very broad range of energies, what was happening with phi to the 4. Okay? So they give rise to nice theories. Okay? But 
the concept of marginal is a very unstable concept. Because here, everything I have been telling you is classical. Classical field theory. But now, you will be making quantum corrections. And a marginal operator is an, in some unstable point, which is uh, not relevant, not irrelevant, it's just in the middle. But just a tiny quantum correction to this operator will make it either relevant or irrelevant. Okay, and let's see how this happens. You do quantum corrections. Quantum corrections means that you renormalize your coupling and you get the running coupling constant. Okay. And the running coupling constant at one loop has this form. So now the, the, your coupling depends on energy. Let's imagine that we take quantum electrodynamics. In quantum electrodynamics, this coefficient here is 2 over 3, sum over the electric charges of all the fermions of your theory, times the number of fermions, number of flavors with this electric charge. And this is a positive number. So this is 1 minus something positive, this log. Now, if you make Q square much smaller than your reference scale, Q0, and I take the limit where Q square goes to 0, the log is negative. So you get a huge positive number in the denominator. So your coupling goes to zero. So QED is an irrelevant theory. Okay. It was marginal, it was normalizable, but once you take into account quantum corrections, the coupling becomes very, very small. Okay. And at low energies, it becomes irrelevant. The effects are very low. Electromagnetic corrections are small. If you do the same with QCD, now the sign is different because beta 1 is negative. Okay? And now it happens the opposite. Usually you analyze the behavior of the coupling at very high energies. So you know when Q squared grows, <coughs> the QCD coupling goes to zero while the QED coupling grows. But we are analyzing low energies. And at low energies, the behavior is the opposite. The QCD coupling, in fact, has a pole here. So it grows and grows. It goes to infinity. So QCD, which is a marginal theory, it's a, th a dimensional four theory, at low energies becomes extremely relevant. And how do you see that? Nuclear physics is much more important that electromagnetic physics. Okay, whenever you have any low energy phenomena where you have electromagnetic interactions and strong interactions, you forget about the electromagnetic ones. Because the important ones are the strong ones. Okay? So, dimensions are extremely important. Quantum corrections change dimensions. Okay? Change dimensions logarithmically, but that's enough to change the behavior. Okay, let's now try to analyze quantum corrections in a more, much more careful way. Okay, that's something very tricky, but it's important that you understand it because then you will avoid many mistakes. And unfortunately, those are mistakes that propagate a lot. So imagine that I take this theory. So it's a theory with a fundamental fermion, or some fermion, I don't care whether it is fundamental or not. It has some mass m. And now it has <coughs> operators of increasing dimensionality. So I have written four fermion operators. Okay. Since there are four fermion operators, they have dimension 6. So the couplings should be suppressed by lambda square. But in this operator, I have put two derivatives. So the suppression is lambda to the fourth. And now you, dots means that you will have operators that are suppressed by lambda to the 6, lambda to the 8, lambda to the 10, etc., etc. And you are aiming to make an effective description of this system. So a description that is valid at low energies and is useful. So the most important uh, concept in effective field theory is something should be useful. 
And useful means that you can cut the expansion. If you need to take into account the infinite number of terms, then the effective field theory is not worth for anything. What you want to make sure is that uh, taking only the first, the second, maybe the third uh, and the fourth term, you get a good approximation to whatever process you want to describe. Okay. So, let's take this Lagrangian. Let's assume that physics is dominated by the first operator, the one proportional to A, and let's compute the most simple quantum correction. So, I put here the coupling A, I do a tadpole, and this gives me a correction to the fermion propagator. Okay. So, it gives a contribution to the mass of the fermion. Now, let's compute it. So, I have A divided lambda square. I have uh, four fermion fields and I close a loop, so I will get a factor of two because there are two different ways in doing that. I have a loop, so it's y integral, the loop factor and the propagator. The propagator in the numerator has a k slash plus m, but I am just computing the correction to the mass, so it's the m. Okay, the k slash will go to the kinetic term. So I need to compute this integral. And of course you know that this integral is divergent. So you need to renormalize. Okay? But uh, you are not scared about that. You know how to renormalize things. But what you should have clearly in mind is that anything you compute cannot depend on the, on the conventions that you use to compute it. You are doing physics. And physics does not depend on conventions. So things cannot depend on strange factors. Now, you know this is a divergent integral. You need to regularize the integral to start with. You need to compute things, then you will renormalize, or blah, blah, blah. So let's do the most naive thing you could do. The most naive thing is say, okay, let's put a cutoff. Okay, I can even give a physical answer to put a cutoff. It's, it's an effective theory. The theory is only valid for energies below lambda, because I am expanding in powers of energy over lambda. So let's cut, cut the integral at lambda. Well, if you do that, that's the result you get. Delta m is proportional to m divided by lambda square, and now the integral brings you a factor lambda square, because it diverges quadratically. Lambda square cancels this lambda square. The result is proportional to m. Okay? So the result does not contain any suppression factor. I have lost the 1 over lambda square that was telling me that this is a correction over this. Okay? Is that wrong? No. But I should be very careful, because if I accept that, then I should compute the effect of this operator. I don't have any argument to say that this operator gives a smaller correction than this operator. If I take this operator, I will get the same type of result, but with an additional k square in the numerator. And I will be getting lambda to the fourth divided by lambda to the fourth, result the same. So the only suppression that I will be getting is the usual loop suppression, 1 over 16 pi square. So the loop correction is smaller than the three level contribution. But all operators of any arbitrary order in powers of 1 over lambda square will give a contribution which is of the same order to the thing I am computing. Which means that if I do a cutoff regularization, I need to resum the complete series. Otherwise, my result does not have any meaning. Is clear the problem? Okay, so this is very dangerous. So, uh, what you should learn from that first, if you can avoid doing cutoff regularizations. Okay, not always you, you will do will be able to do that. For instance, if you are doing a lattice calculation, a lattice calculation is a cutoff regularization. 
So you cannot avoid the problem, but then you need to work out because you need to be able to prove that your result is correct. So you need to work much more than not doing that. Okay? But then if you are not doing a lattice calculation, that you are doing a normal continuous uh, field theory calculation, if you use a cutoff, then you need to face this problem. And facing this problem is not easy because you need to do many things. Okay? In fact, uh, the cutoff is being used, unfortunately, in many works. Some of them are correct, some of them are not. Okay? So, one, you, could, you could get uh, many answers which are completely strange just because you are playing with something that you don't really control. The problem is that you are trying to do two things. Here in the expansion, this lambda, lambda is not a cutoff. Lambda is a true physical scale that you don't know. Some high energy thing that you want to guess, like the electron mass before. While in the loop integral, the loop integral, the only physical scales are the scales appearing in the factors here, this mass. When you put a cutoff, this is a completely arbitrary thing. Okay. A quantum field theory, the only content that it has are the singularities of the quantum field theory, the poles of the propagators, the cuts of your diagrams. Okay. Uh, uh, and a cutoff regularization does not bring additional physical input. So you should be careful. So what are you supposed to do? Well, let's say with dimensional regularization. But that's why dimensional regularization is so useful. You do the same calculation, but now you put the result of this integral in dimensional regularization. It has dimension 2. So what are you going to get? Two powers of the physical scale appearing in the integral. And the only physical scale is m. So you don't get lambda squared divided by lambda squared. You get m squared divided by lambda squared. And if you take the B operator, you will get M to the fourth divided by lambda to the fourth. And if you use a, an operator of dimension 28, you will get M to the 28 power divided by lambda to the 28 power. So you are respecting your basic principle. And your basic principle is you are making properly in exp an expansion in powers of energy over some physical scale. Okay, and now you are sure that the term B is going to give a correction which is smaller than the term A. So your series expansion makes sense. Your effective field theory makes sense at the quantum level. So this is the usual diversion, the log. Remember the 1 over epsilon, the diversion thing always have the same coefficient as the log. These are things that you already know. So, any question up to here? Okay, so there is no free lunch. So, don't do cutoff regularization, never. Do dimensional regularization, but dimensional regularization also has problems. So, let's analyze what are the problems of dimensional regularization. For that, let's go to QED. And let's just take the vacuum polarization of the photon for a massless fermion. <coughs> okay, so I'm sure you have done the calculation at some point. So this diversion this is the usual 1 over epsilon factor. The usual log, there are no masses. So Q squared is the only variable where Q is the four moment that going th through the photon propagator. And there is this factor minus 5 over 3 that you will see in a moment where it comes from. Now, you want to renormalize the coupling. So you separate this result into a divergent piece and a renormalized piece. The blob does not depend on any mu. Mu is nothing. It's an auxiliary scale does not contain any physics, but in the moment you separate things, this depends on mu, this depends on mu. Okay, let's go on. 
You compute, for instance, electron scattering. Lobos order, you exchange one photon. So you have a factor one over Q squared that I didn't write, and alpha. Because you have an E here, an E here, E squared is alpha. I have put alpha zero because it's the bare alpha. One loop, you have the blob in the photon propagator. I don't need to renormalize the vertex because of charge conservation, all divergence is cancelled, so only the blob is important. And the blob just makes this one minus the blob. The blob is this pi. What is renormalization? It's simply, this is divergent, alpha zero, you don't know what it is. Okay, you know what it is at three level, okay, but at the quantum at the loop level you need to define, so you define alpha zero times one minus the divergent piece, you define it as the renormalized coupling, is the definition, and the rest now is your renormalized two-point function. Okay? And it is a definition, it depends on your conventions. First, this depends on mu, this depends on mu, mu is nothing, so it's a convention which value of mu you choose. But it's also a convention, how do you split these two things? You put only this 1 over epsilon in the diversion piece, or you put the 1 over epsilon minus 5 over 3, or the 1 over epsilon plus 425. Okay, so there is an arbitrary convention there, and that's what is called the renormalization scheme. Once you have done this separation, you define your beta function. You take the renormalized coupling, the logarithmic derivative with respect of mu of alpha, that's the beta function. So let's look here. It's clearly that this log of minus q squared goes into the renormalized part. In fact, this is the only physical ingredient that appears there. Okay. This infinity is here. It contains the mu dependent part of the divergent thing. If you look to the renormalized coupling, the renormalized coupling depends on mu because of this infinity part. So what is the beta function? You are taking the derivative with respect of mu of that. Okay, so what is beta 1? 2 divided by 3. It's a trivial calculation. Okay, everybody agrees? Once you know the value of beta 1, you integrate this differential equation and you get the running coupling. Okay? And the fact that beta 1 is 2 over 3, of course, times qf squared, and is positive, okay, gives you the behavior in QED of the beta function. Let's analyze what happens with this calculation if instead of a massless fermion, I take a massive one. The only difference is that the calculation, instead of the log of minus q squared over mu squared, I get something a little bit more involved, because I keep the mass. Here you see, if I put the mass to zero, log of minus q squared divided by mu squared is multiplied by this integral. This integral, the result is 1 over 6, which cancels with the 6, and I get the log I had before, and my, the minus 5 over 3, comes from the integral of the log of x, 1 minus x. So, so those are trivial integrals. Now let's think how we are going to renormalize that. So how to split that into the divergent piece and the renormalized piece? Which uh, uh, renormalization scheme we want to use? So let's use first what I will call a physical renormalization scheme. A physical renormalization scheme is, let's say, let's define the divergent piece taking q squared equal to minus mu squared. So the value of the complete thing at some reference value of q squared, minus mu squared, I put it here, okay, and the rest I put it here. So this is my renormalized function. Look at it, I go, I, I go back. So 
I have put here plus mu square. Okay, and this is what I have taken as reference value. And now, of course, I need to compensate, so I need to divide that by the same thing with u square equal to minus mu square. So that's the renormalized thing in this renormalization scheme. What is the beta function? The beta function, so I need to take this derivative, putting here plus mu square. So this is the beta function. And now you analyze how the beta function behaves as function of mass. When the mass becomes very, very large, it suppresses I1 as 1 over mass square, so it goes to 0. When the mass goes to 0, okay, so the beta function goes to the usual value 2 over 3 times the electric charge square. That is what everybody use in dimensional regularization. Okay. And that's very good. So at very small masses, you recover the MS bar result. But at very large masses, beta 1 goes as 1 over the mass square. Your renormalized function, look at here, goes as 1 over mass square. Okay? And that's what you want, because that means the coupling. So, think now in the following way. Imagine that uh, you are doing quantum electrodynamics at very, very low energies. At 100 MeV, 200 MeV, 500 MeV. Quantum electrodynamics at such low energies only contains electrons and photons, maybe muons, but nothing more. But you know that the top exists. The top corrects the electromagnetic interaction. But it will be crazy to do calculations with the top every time you want to do a QED calculation at 100 MeV. Okay, the, lob, sh the top should be negligible. Well, it is negligible, because if you are at very low values of Q square, the top is very, very, very heavy, it does not affect your physics. It decouples. Okay. But it's more than that. Imagine that uh, at uh, 100 TeV, there exists a fermion that we don't know, some technicolor or whatever fermion, which is charged. It interacts with the photon. Okay. This decoupling guarantees that it does not affect your physics at 100 MeV. So it's a good requirement that heavy physics decouple from your low energy physics. Because if it does not decouple, there is nothing you can do. Because then your physics will be depending on things that you don't know. Okay, what happens in the MS bar scheme? So, remember, we are computing that. The MS bar scheme is mass independent. That's why it's so simple, because it does not depend on, on mass scales. You do simple calculations. But since it does not depend on mass scales, it does not decouple. So, the same calculation in the MS bar scheme is this, tells you that beta 1 is 2 over 3 times the electric charge square independently on, on the value of the fermion mass. So the top mass is correcting alpha at 100 MeV. But if there is a charge fermion at the Planck mass scale, it's also correcting alpha at 100 MeV. Okay. Your renormalized vacuum polarization grows logarithmically with the mass of the heavy fermion. So perturbation theory breaks down. So if you renormalize quantum electrodynamics in the MS bar scheme and there is a fermion at the Planck mass scale, 
quantum electrodynamics is a divergent series. Questions? Okay. So how do you solve that? And here we are really at the heart of effective field theory. The crucial word is integrate out heavy particles and it's called matching. You should be thinking about effective field theory as an onion. Yes? But is it the real problem? Because it is. I mean, even without disintegrating before, just. Is it. That then. That, that, is it the real problem? Because since it, it, your result, your physical, for example, the cross section or whatever you calculate, it shouldn't depend on the scheme you choose, right? Yes. So, if you're doing things correctly, then this shouldn't be a problem because then you can choose your the better scheme, no? I mean uh, well, but I am choosing this scheme. The only thing I am saying is that this scheme is very bad. Of course, you should get the same result, but you need to resum all the series. But you can argue that if you you can say that you chose if you choose if you make a wrong decision, you choose a different you, wrong, you choose a wrong scheme. You get some, you can you get the perturbation theory breakdown, mm -hmm. and you say, I chose the wrong scheme. I try another one. Yes, and there is no problem. Okay, but then why why do you do calculations in MS bar? It's a wrong scheme. That, that's I don't know. <laughs> I don't do calculations in MS bar, but <laughs> 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 but okay, okay. Okay, every scheme has its own problem. So first, I have this cut off regularization, and it has a terrible problem. I don't want to touch that. But MS bar has also MS bar or MS or MS minus twenty. Okay, mass independent schemes don't decouple. We use them because they are very simple. They are very efficient when we do calculations. But we should be aware of this problem. Okay, so then the next step will be how to cure. Yes, so that's the that's the solution. Okay, so what what that means? One says integrate out because if you think in terms of uh, path integrals, it's an integral over fields. So you really remove completely the heavy field from your Lagrangian. You integrate <coughs> it out. What that means? That you are making an onion of effective field theories. So what that means? Imagine this is uh, energy scale, and this is the mass of your heavy fermion. Okay? If you are at energies which are above the mass of this fermion, you have a quantum field theory which contains a fermion. Okay? And this quantum field theory has the beta function in MS bar, which contains the contribution of this fermion plus the contribution of all the other fermions which are lighter. But when you go to energies which are very small compared with this mass, you don't want the heavy fermion to be there. Because if the heavy fermion is there, then it will generate these kind of ugly corrections to your observables. So what you do is you change your quantum field theory. The quantum field theory above the mass and the quantum field theory below the mass are different quantum field theories. They have different content field, o sea, field content. Okay? This only contains the light degrees of freedom. This one contains the light degrees of freedom plus the massive fermion. But your physics should be the same. What means that your physics will be the same? That the couplings here and here are different. Couplings are uh, convention dependent parameters, usually auxiliary parameters, useful auxiliary parameters. So, in a region around this line where both theories are valid, okay, because the energy is not so different of the mass, both theories by definition should provide exactly the same answer for all physical observables. Okay. And imposing that the two theories provide the same answer is called matching. So this is a condition you impose. You have the theory with your heavy fermion 
In this theory, you have fixed the coupling. Okay? You use all your renormalization tools to go down in energy. You can compute everything. Now here, you change theory. You go to a different level in your onion. When you change theory, the second theory is an effective theory of the first one. This effective theory does not contain the heavy fermion. So the heavy fermion will appear giving higher order operators suppressed by powers of 1 over the heavy fermion mass. Okay? But even at the dimension 4 term, the coupling in this theory and in this theory will be different. And how do you fix the coupling in your effective theory? Requiring that any S matrix element computed in the two theories in the region where both theories are valid provides the same answer, okay, which is called matching. I will show uh, this in some explicit examples in a moment to clarify the concept. Okay? But then the important thing to remember is that you are doing effective field theory all the time. Because when you discuss QED with just electrons and photons, this is an effective field theory of QED in the standard model with six quarks and six leptons. Those are two different theories. The couplings are different. Mm -hmm. Any question? Up to Any question up to here? Don't allow me to go too, too fast. I think it's better that if you stop me and we don't go too far away, but at least we fix all the concepts clearly. Because then when we will go to explicit quantum field theories, all these things are going to appear in all cases. Questions? Nobody wants to, to ask? Okay. This thing of matching appears uh, very weird the first time you see it. It appears strange. Okay? But it's not strange. You are doing that uh, quite often without being uh, too conscious that you are doing it. So let's put an example, a simple one. So let me take an effective field theory with two uh, scalar fields, real fields, one with a small mass m and one with a big mass m. So small m is very, very light compared with big m. And the interaction is just a cubic term Proportional to lambda contains two powers of the light field and one power of the heavy field. So now you know already lambda has dimensions of energy. Now you compute the elastic scattering of two light particles. And of course, since lambda has dimensions of energy, if we go to very high energy, and very high means much higher than any of the two mass scales, you already know the result, the behavior. A cross-section should go as 1 over energy squared, but uh, this is proportional to lambda to the fourth, because it's lambda squared in amplitude, lambda to the fourth in cross-section, so it's suppressed by four additional powers of energy, and at high energies, it goes to zero immediately. But we are interested not in this regime, we are interested in the regime where one mass is much higher than the other one, and we are working at an er energy scale low with respect to the heavy mass. If you do that, then the suppression is not energy to the fourth, it's mass to the fourth. Why? because you are just exchanging the propagators in the ST and U channel that you were worrying about before. Okay? But since the energy, so the heavy field is the one in the propagator, the light fields are the ones in the external legs, since energy is much lower than the heavy mass square, you are making a tailored expansion of the propagator. The lowest order contribution is you just put S or T or U equal to zero, and you get lambda square divided by N square, and this is the square of that. Okay? And you get just a point interaction of four light fields 
with a coupling that is lambda squared divided by m squared. This is this coupling. So this is the effective field theory of that. Okay? Here I am putting that at the level of just couplings. So you integrate out of your Lagrangian the heavy field. So you put this Lagrangian into the path integral and you make the Gaussian integration of the heavy field. It disappears and it will give you a non-local Lagrangian that only depends on the light field. You expand this Lagrangian in powers of energy, okay, powers of derivatives, then it will give you a local Lagrangian with an infinite number of couplings which only contain the light field. At the level of Feynman graphs, it's more simple because what you are doing is you are Taylor expanding the, pro the heavy propagator. So it gives you the lowest order coupling, lambda square over m square, plus things with explicit powers of S, explicit powers of energy square. S means two derivatives. So each one of these contributions means a four leg local coupling, but instead of having a coupling, has a function of energy, so contains derivatives. So those are higher dimensional operators which give you your effective Lagrangian. Okay. So you are going to have an effective Lagrangian which only contains the light fields, only contains operators with the small five times couplings. And what are the dimensionality of the couplings? It depends of the dimension of the operators. It depends of how powers, how many powers of energy you have in this expansion. You see, the first operator will be lambda squared divided by m squared. The next term will be divided by m to the 4, m to the 6, m to the 8, m to the 10. So your couplings will have this form. What is matching? Matching means that you do this expansion, you identify the result on the fundamental theory computing these three graphs, Okay. with the result you get for the cross-section in the effective theory with these operators. You compute in both theories, the result should be the same, you learn the value of the coefficients. Okay. So the coefficient of the lowest order operator is just minus lambda squared divided by m squared, point. Okay. In fact, it's not, it's not that because there are three diagrams and then you need to do what he was complaining about, you need to put the three diagrams, you will get a factor of three at some point. Okay? But this is three-level matching. You want to do matching in a quantum field theory. So you need to do the matching between the fundamental description and the effective description also at the loop level. And at the loop level, things become much more tricky. Because then you need to do that. So. Let's, let me write my effective Lagrangian. My effective Lagrangian only contains the light fields. So, with two fields, I have a derivative square. It's a kinetic term. Okay? But I have put an arbitrary coupling, A. 5 squared, that was the mass term before. This term here. But now, I put an arbitrary coupling, B. 5 to the 4. I have put the three-level result, the result of matching a three-level, this lambda square divided m square with all the combinatorial factors and the three graphs and so on. The result is lambda square divided 8 m square times some coupling C. At three-level, A is 1, B is m square, C is 1. Now you will be keep writing operators, so derivative square of 5 to the 4, derivative to the 4th, and so on. Now you do matching at the one-loop level. So you start computing green functions. For instance, this is the two point, so two external light fields, green function. But here you have a heavy propagator and a light loop. This is the light propagator, and this is the heavy particle. 
So this gives corrections to the two-point function. In the effective 30, you will be first the three-level thing. This contributes, is the propagator. But now you are going to have a three-level contribution at order p square, order p to the four, in fact. I am putting one. So one means the difference between A and B from their three level values. Or whatever it comes from higher order operators. Here I put my lowest order coupling, so this, but I do a loop. I take a green function with four legs. I compute the loops in the fundamental theory. I compute all possible contributions in the effective theory. And the result should be the same because the physics should be the same. So th those are equations, and these equations allow you to fix A, B, C, and whatever else comes above that at the one loop level. Okay? So A will be one, that's the three level result, plus some number that will come from your calculation times a factor lambda squared divided the loop factor 16 pi squared divided by m squared. If you do it at two loops, it will get a contribution, lambda to the 4 divided by m to the 4, with two loop factors, and so on. So a matching calculation can be a complicated calculation. Okay? But you need to do that. What is the advantage of uh, doing the matching calculation? Once you have fixed these couplings, A, B, and C, you forget about the heavy field. Okay? You have go down one level in your onion. So what you have gained with that, you are avoiding this problem. Because once you have get rid properly of the heavy field, the heavy field no longer will destroy the convergence of your perturbative expansion. Okay? I will put uh, some examples in a moment, but imagine, for instance, the following thing. Does the proton mass depend on the top quark mass? Can anybody answer that? Sure. Hmm? Why not? Why? But the tops are there? Well, but how little? No, no, it, it, it depends just uh, because of the scale, it depends a little. I mean, if, if, if I see that, the electromagnetic coupling at low energy depends on the top. The electromagnetic self-energy depends on the top. Okay? So, if I measure alpha at 1 TV, or at the Z mass, okay, and this is my measurement of alpha, and now I evolve down this alpha at low energy to find out what is the value of alpha at the proton mass scale, this depends on the top mass. Okay. But if I measure the value of alpha at low energies, I measure it, point. Okay. But then at low energies, I am using an effective field theory which does not contain the top. Otherwise, what I am doing is not consistent. So, think always in the, the onion. Okay? The onion has levels. You should always be consistent to the level where you are working. <coughs> and only when you try to match two different levels of the onion, you should write a matching condition. Let's put... Okay, let, let, let me first summarize in a set of principles, all what we have seen up to now, and then I will leave an exercise for you to do so that you understand matching properly. So what is an effective field theory? You are just using common sense. And common sense says low energy dynamics <coughs> should not depend on the details of whatever happens at high energies. If your physics at low energies depends on the Planck mass scale, or whatever happens there, that you don't know, then you should stop doing physics. 
because you cannot predict anything. Your physics is going to depend on things that you don't know. Okay? Fortunately, this does not happen. But for this to not, not to happen, you need to formulate things in the proper way. So low energy dynamics should be independent of ultraviolet behavior. You want to use the appropriate physics description for any physical system you want to analyze. So if you want to do biology, you don't use quantum electrodynamics. If you want to do chemistry, you don't use quantum electrodynamics. You use something else. But you know that the electromagnetic interaction is there. So the first thing you need to do is you need to analyze what are the right degrees of freedom for the physical system you want to describe. Once you identify the right degrees of freedom, you can build an effective theory appropriate for these degrees of freedom. Okay, the ones which are really relevant. You can build an effective field theory every time you find out that there are energy gaps. So if you are able to say, I am in uh, some energy regime where I can make some masses to infinity, so I can decouple them, they are not relevant for my physics, while some others you can put to zero, then you are in business. Because you decouple the heavy degrees of freedom, the light degrees of freedom you work in the limit of zero masses, and then you can compute the small corrections proportional to the small masses. In some cases, for instance, if you are doing B physics, then you can try to compute corrections which are suppressed by inverse powers of the heavy mass. Okay, and you find out the appropriate effective field theory for that. If you take a functional integral, the path integral, and you integrate out a heavy field, you are going to find a non-local Lagrangian. What that means? If I exchange a propagator, this is a non-local thing. It depends on Q square. Okay? This is not a Lagrangian. This is a non-local interaction. The heavy field is no longer there. It's a four-leg interaction of light fields, but it's an interaction that is not just a coupling. There is a propagator in the middle. But if I do a Taylor expansion of this propagator, I convert this non-local interaction into an infinite sum of local interactions. And now all these local interactions, I can describe them with Lagrangians, local Lagrangians. So that's what you do in an effective field theory. You decouple some fields and you trade the non-local effects of these heavy fields in a tower of local interactions, because that's easier. To handle. There is a question of accuracy, and this is what the classical textbooks are wrong. And what any classical textbook in quantum field theory tells you is that you should only use renormalizable interactions because otherwise uh, you don't have predictivity. And what is the definition of a renormalizable interaction? The definition is that you only have a finite number of divergences. Therefore, you only have a finite number of unknown couplings. And then with a finite number of measurements, you fix your theory. While a non-renormalizable theory means a theory which contains an infinite number of divergences, therefore an infinite number of couplings. You need an infinite number of inputs, so you don't have any predictivity. You can predict whatever you want. Okay. So an effective field theory contains a tower of interactions that are infinite. So this is a non-renormalizable theory. But in physics, you never compute anything with infinite precision. In physics, you always aim for some accuracy. The accuracy can be very, very, very small. Okay? But you always aim for an accuracy. So you need to tell me what is the accuracy with which 
you need to compute something. Okay? If you want to compute uh, the behavior of uh, uh, some organic uh, molecule with 250 digits of precision, I'm sure you need quantum electrodynamics. But this never happens. Okay? You Usually when a, a chemist is doing some calculation, well, he needs a 1% precision, maybe a 1 per mil precision sometimes, and for that you don't need quantum electrodynamics. You need something else. Here is the same. You tell me the accuracy with which you want to compute, and this tells you how many operators you need to include in your Lagrangian. Your Lagrangian is ordered as powers of energy over a heavy mass scale, okay? and each term, depending on the dimensionality, is suppressed by more or less powers of m. So you, should, you only need to include those powers, those dimensions, such that your energy divided by m to the appropriate power is larger than the accuracy you are aiming to. Okay, here I have put this equation as an upper bound on the dimensionality of the operators I need to include in my description. Which means that you tell me the, the, the accuracy, I tell you how many operators you need to include. So you always will be working with a finite number of operators, so your theory will always be a renormalizable theory. Of course, for this to work, I need that my th expansion is well behaved at the quantum level. So I cannot use a cutoff regularization. Otherwise, I need to sum the complete series. An effective field theory has exactly the same infrared behavior as the fundamental theory. Because the behavior in the infrared of a quantum field theory is generated by the poles of the propagators. It's generated by the degrees of freedom that you are exchanging. Okay. The light degrees of freedom are the same in the effective theory and in the underlying fundamental theory. So the behavior at low energy of the two theories is exactly the same. In addition, through matching, you have fixed the couplings. So they give the same results. However, in the ultraviolet, they are different. Because the underlying theory contains the heavy degrees of freedom, the effective theory does not contain the heavy degrees of freedom. So the ultraviolet behavior of the standard model is good. The ultraviolet behavior of the Fermi theory is very bad. Okay, so that's what makes a difference between one and the other. Last point, think about the Fermi theory. In the Fermi theory, the W is no longer there. Where is the W? In the Fermi coupling. So, in the effective low energy theory, all the information about the heavy degrees of freedom, the degrees of freedom that are no longer explicit in your Lagrangian, is hidden in the couplings. So, you want to measure the couplings, and then if you want to learn what happens above your theory, you need to find out what is the dependence of your couplings on the ultraviolet degrees of freedom. Okay? In the Fermi coup uh, coupling, that's very clear. You, from the muon lifetime, you measure the Fermi coupling, okay? and then you know that there is some degree of freedom at the electroweak scale you know that the W should exist. Okay? You don't see the W explicit in your theory. You learn that from the coupling that you measure. So what the, we are aiming now at LHC is, unfortunately, we don't see anything new. Okay? So we need to do an effective field theory. We need to analyze uh, tiny deviations from the standard model predictions. And from these tiny deviations, guess what is above the standard model that we don't know is hidden in the couplings. And here my question about the top comes again. You do quantum electrodynamics at low energy with muons, electrons and photons, you measure alpha. 
the information about the top is hidden in this alpha. But you don't know it because you have measured the parameter. Okay. Of course, if now you take this parameter and you run this parameter to higher energies using the renormalization group equations and you have enough precision, maybe, maybe you can guess something. Not about the top, about the things which are before the top. Okay, so, ultraviolet behavior, ultraviolet degrees of freedom are hidden in the couplings. They are not explicit. So, this is what you do to evolve theories. So, you have a boundary, that is where you do matching. You have a fundamental theory which contains light degrees of freedom and your heavy degrees of freedom. This fundamental theory contains a Lagrangian which depends on both, contains a normalization group equations which depend on both. If you go to low energies, the heavy degree of freedom is no longer there. You integrate it out. You have an effective Lagrangian which only de depends on the light degree of freedom. This piece is the same, but now there is an, e an additional piece which comes from this one. All the information on the heavy field is hidden in the couplings below. This has a different renormalization group equations. Couplings evolve in a different way because the beta function is different. And you need to relate couplings in this theory and couplings in this theory through matching. If you think, for instance, QED or QCD, in the standard model you have six quarks and six leptons. Okay? So you start at the electroweak scale, you go down in energy, so you integrate out the W, you integrate out the Z, you integrate out the top. So every time you integrate one particle, you cross one level of the onion. The strong coupling or the QED coupling with six quark flavors is different from the coupling with five quark flavors. is different from the coupling in a theory with four quark flavors and so on. So there are many levels of matching that you need to do. So this is the exercise that I want to propose to you if you have never done it. Some of you already know this exercise. So you take just QCD. This is QCD with n flavors of quarks. And let's assume that all quarks are massless except one. Okay, so all the masses are zero, but one of the quarks has a very heavy mass. Now we want to work at energies which are very small compared to this heavy mass. So we take this object out from the theory. What will be the effective theory? QCD with n minus 1 flavors, that will be the dimension 4 part of the effective Lagrangian, is the same QCD Lagrangian, because of gauge invariant, plus higher order operators, which are suppressed by inverse powers of the heavy mass. So, 4 fermion operators, 6 fermion operators, and so on. So, let's forget about that. So, let's remain at the renormalizable level, dimension 4. This theory and this theory are different theories because the field content of the two theories is different. The beta functions are different. The couplings are different. Okay. So let's take the coupling in the fundamental theory with n flavors and let's take the coupling in the other theory with n minus 1 flavors. One coupling should be an expansion in terms of the other coupling. I don't know this expansion, okay? but this is the coupling in one theory, this is the coupling in the other theory. At the classical level, they are equal. But once I put quantum corrections, I will have a perturbative expansion with coefficients that in general will depend logarithmically on the renormalization scale of the heavy fermion mass square. Masses are also different. And you should not be surprised about that 
because quark masses are just couplings. We don't observe quarks. Well, these are matching equations. Okay, and these matching equations nowadays are already known to four loops. So we know them quite precisely. These matching equations tell you that the coupling is not a continuous function. Every time you jump from one theory to the other, the coupling changes. That is a jump. But the, the coupling is not an observable. The exercise I want you to do is you know beta 1 in QCD. And you know that beta 1 depends on the number of flavors. Since beta 1 depends on the number of flavors, the running of this coupling and the running of this coupling is different. Okay. So compute the logarithmic dependence of the first coefficient just knowing the value of beta 1. clear the exercise? It's very simple, so you don't need to do an involved calculation. You only need to know what is the dependence of beta 1 with the fermion flavors, which I think at some point that Okay, so let's see. The derivative of alpha with respect to mu is beta 1 times alpha over pi, and beta 1 depends on the number of flavors. Okay, any question up to here? Okay, I think that I think it's better if we stop here, otherwise it's going to get too long. So questions? Okay. Uh, strange question. Why is it called integrating out? Uh, yes, because This is the path integral. Okay, so you have an action which depends on two fields, and you have a functional integral on these two fields. Integrate out means you do explicitly this integration. So you go from here to an integral which only contains the light fields, because you have done explicitly the integral, with an action which now the result is an action which only depends on the light field. Of course, if you do this process, you are going to find a non-local Lagrangian here. It's your propagators, your loops, those are non-local things. So you do the integration if you are able, and once you have done the integration, you tailor, expand whatever result you get, and then you get a local thing, which is your effective Lagrangian or your effective action. In this formalism, uh, there is nothing too much. You compute, you get everything. Okay. Matching means that you guess what the answer is. Okay. You have your effective theory, you have your fundamental theory, you fix your terms with symmetries. You have arbitrary couplings, and now you compute with both theories at any level you want to compute, and you match. If you are able to do the functional integrals, you have everything. But that's much harder. More questions? 
Okay, so tomorrow. Thank <laughs> you.